Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Ellen Lautenberg, a board member for Exposomics and Children's Environmental Health at Mount Sinai. It is my pleasure to welcome you to this week's lunchtime chat and to serve as the moderator for our discussion today. This series has been a great introduction to the transformational research, clinical care, and translational work happening at Mount Sinai. If you have missed any of the sessions, the videos are available on the Institute for Exposomic Research's YouTube channel and website. Today, Dr. Aurora will discuss how environmental factors in early childhood and even in utero may play a key role in the development of autism, ALS, and other complex neurological diseases. Dr. Aurora is an environmental epidemiologist and exposure biologist. His research focuses on how prenatal and early childhood chemical exposures and the ways in which our bodies respond to those exposures affect our lifelong health trajectories. Dr. Aurora is known for his pioneering work on biomarkers that uses shed baby teeth to reconstruct the timing of past environmental exposures. His methods are being applied to the study of a variety of health outcomes, including autism, ADHD, schizophrenia, and Lou Gehrig's disease, or ALS. He is the recipient of numerous grants and honors, and under the Obama administration, he was awarded the prestigious Presidential Early Careers Award for Scientists and Engineers. Today's presentation will be about 25 minutes, followed by 20 minutes for Q&A. I encourage you to submit your questions using the Q&A function and if we can't get to your questions, we will work to get you answers in a follow-up email. And with that, Dr. Aurora, please take the stage. Um, Ellen, thank, thank you so much for that uh, generous introduction. Um, and thank you to the organizers for this opportunity for me to present here. Um, as is often the case in, uh, in those of us who engage in technology development, I just want to put up this slide for the conflict of interest declarations. Um, and while I'm doing so, I want to clarify that the talk today is meant for an audience who are not scientists per se by training, but who have a deep interest in science. But at any stage, if uh, anyone is interested in a deeper look at what I'm presenting, please send us an email and I would be happy to share the data behind um, any of the slides that, that I'm sharing. So I want to start off by um, sharing this uh, very simple yet an idea that has taken us so long to arrive at. That it is not nature versus nurture, it is not genetics versus environment, but rather both. That most complex diseases, especially the diseases that I'll be discussing today, like autism spectrum disorder, are a combination of genetic and environmental factors. In the background of some genetic and heritable risk, the environment plays a major role. And although I'll be sharing some pathways with very biochemical sounding names, the reality is that our environment, especially our social and emotional environment, has a very big impact on how our brains develop and generally on the lifelong trajectory of health and disease. With that said, let's focus on this very unique and perhaps one of the most important organs in our body, the brain. Most of us would have seen a similar image of the brain if, if you're a scientist like me in a textbook or if you're just interested on, on the web. What you will find is that often we have this, uh, we often have this uh, very structural and static view of, uh, of our brain. It is as if it is made up of component parts that, uh, that don't move. But that is far from the truth. In fact, in reality, the brain is a highly dynamic organ. And what we will, uh, the way I want to convey that to you is by showing you this slide, which is provided by the American Psychiatric Association and has been reproduced many, many times. Soon after conception, our brain starts to develop and it develops at a very rapid pace in a well orchestrated and complex pattern. Many things have to happen in sequence for our brain to develop properly. 
And much of this is happening even before we are born. And it continues to happen after birth in the first year of life, well into adolescence. So our brain development takes a long time. It happens very rapidly, but it's not at an even pace. In fact, early life might be one of the most important periods for brain development. And let's keep that in mind as I discuss the, the reality of how autism diso spectrum disorder is detected and then treated. Well, I hope I have made an argument for the importance of the brain and the complexity of the brain and what a unique organ it is. So it begs the question, well, if the brain is such an important and unique organ, how are our brains doing at a population level? And let me answer that by showing you an example. It's, it's a startling example from the world of autism spectrum disorder research. It shouldn't come as, as, as news to most of us who are in the neurological sciences that the rates of autism spectrum disorder are now increasing quite rapidly. I always say that the year I was born to now, the rates have increased by about 9,000% in almost those 45 years. Recently, now we are seeing that rate has continued to increase and we are looking at, at prevalence of about one to 2% of autism spectrum disorder in the US. To clarify, uh, there are many reasons behind this. It's not all that the disease is actually increasing. Some of it is that we are better at detecting the disease. We have better diagnostic tools and we just have better awareness. But there's also a real increase. And the key factor here is that genetics alone cannot explain such a sharp rise in autism rates. The environment must be playing uh, an important uh, role in, um, in, this, in, this, in, in this sharp rise in autism spectrum disorder. So is this just a US story? Well, no, this is happening uh, in most parts of the world where we have good data. Here is an example from uh, some studies done in three different countries in Europe. As you see, autism spectrum disorder is increasing similar to the way it's increasing in the US but so are other childhood neurodevelopmental disorders such as attention deficit disorder or, or obsessive compulsive disorder, also known as OCD. So there is this upward trend in neurodevelopmental disorders that we are seeing worldwide. What role does the environment play? And I'm gonna present data that contradicts initially that the environment plays a big role. This study was, uh, was led by one of my colleagues, Dr. Avi Reichenberg, and I'll be sharing some slides with you that he has provided quite, quite generously. So this recent study that was published in a very renowned journal and a very well done study over five countries with a large sample size concluded that heritability of autism is somewhere around 80%. And if you do a quick scan of literature, you will find prevalence or heritability rates of between 50 and 80%. So what role does the environment play when heritability is so high? And I stress upon this because this has led to some major misconceptions that heritability somehow must indicate that it is all genetics. In fact, Avi or Dr. Reichenberg himself helped me answer this question by saying that heritability is not all genetics. He provided this very nice slide from another study of his that said, well, let's look at twins. Let's look at identical twins here that I've highlighted as MZ or monozygotic twins. And the message here is that if heritability was only genetics, then monozygotic twins would share a very high level of risk. By that, I mean, if one twin developed autism, it should be an almost certainty that the other twin also develops autism. But in fact, that number here is close to just 40%. And again, this alludes to the fact that heritability is not all genetics. We, in fact, we inherit a lot of our social behavior, things like diet that move through families, 
through cultures, through neighborhoods. So heritability cannot all be explained by these simple twin studies. And that's, that's the key message here, that the environment is important even when heritability estimates are quite high. Again, I'm sharing one more slide from, from Avi's work and, and one of his colleagues. What are the risk factors? If the environment is important, what do we know so far about the risk factors that increase our risk of autism? And as you move down this graph, these factors are now heading towards the factors that can be protective or have an inverse risk with autism spectrum disorder. And as you move from left to right, we are looking at factors that go from very rare, where our, where our chances of exposure are quite low, to factors that can be quite common. So let's let's look at let's start at one end, valproate, which is which is an antipsychotic or anti-epileptic seizure drug. Um, and sure, in large studies, it has been shown that if it is taken, that especially during pregnancy, the risk of autism spectrum disorder is high for the offspring but our chances of exposure to this drug are quite low. Very few of us will ever get exposed to this. However, if we move towards the right, we start seeing factors that are far more common. My own interest is in factors such as chemical toxins. There's also been much debate about the role of vaccines. So I don't want to ignore that point. I'm not a vaccine researcher myself, however, the consensus based on many large studies is that vaccines are safe. And in fact, some studies actually show that vaccines would actually reduce the risk of autism spectrum disorder. So vaccines may be protective against autism spectrum disorder. But that's the global picture. That's the answer to the question, how are our brains doing when it comes to autism spectrum disorder? But that global picture is not what individual families and parents and children with autism spectrum disorder experience at an individual level. So what are the urgent needs when it comes to detecting autism spectrum disorder and treating it? There is some hope here and I want to share some very what I call optimistic outlooks on, on this condition. One of the earlier studies that was well conducted was known as the early star Denver model. And it has been replicated many, many times with several of those replications showing similar positive outcomes. Not every study has been able to replicate that, that potentially positive benefit, but many have. And what they have shown is that if you deliver this model, which, which is based around treating children early, we can see significant improvements in IQ adaptive behavior, the key components that are impacted in autism. But this is one model. There have been other studies. This was one model called the PAC model that was done in Europe. And this has been published several times in the journal Lancet, which is a, again, a, a very reputable journal showing that not only does early intervention result in better outcomes for children with autism. They did the initial study on 150 children and after six years went and reanalyzed 120 of them and found that that intervention, the PACT intervention, produced a sustained improvement in children with autism symptoms and social communication with parents, which remained improved after six years of treatment. So six years after the treatment had ended, the children are still doing better. Again, for clarity, not every study on early intervention has shown these sustained um, improvements, but many studies have. So there is something here that we should be optimistic about. However, there behind this lies a real problem, a real barrier why parents, families that are affected by autism spectrum disorder can't access treatment early enough. So if early treatment works, why aren't we delivering it to all children with autism spectrum disorder? So herein lies something that is almost unique to uh, neurodevelopmental conditions that often they're diagnosed in the absence of biomarkers. Let's compare it to something else for which there is a well-developed blood test like diabetes. So if we go into a doctor's office we are concerned about diabetes, we expect there to be multiple tools that are used, including a blood test. However, for autism spectrum disorder, 
there are no tests, there are no biomarkers. So these are diagnosed entirely based on the behavior of the children. And that has many consequences. There has also been a, this imbalance in the effort that the research community has placed on trying to understand what are the risk factors for autism. Much of the research has been done in genetics and not so much on the environmental factors. And in, as a consequence of that, what has happened is although so much has been invested on genetic research, we haven't really found the mutation that leads to most of autism cases. There is no autism gene that explains all the autism cases. And that has left us with very limited tools to diagnose autism early. <clears throat> I want to go back to a point I made earlier in, in the talk that the brain is a highly dynamic system. It is changing very rapidly and much of that rapid change happens in the first year of life. How is that biology of the brain linked to this problem of not being able to detect and treat children with autism early enough and effectively enough? Well, this is how it works. If you look at this very simple, in some ways an oversimplification of how our brain works, you will see that our sensory pathways and our language pathways are most active right after birth and the first year of life. And then they start to, to decrease, they start to diminish. Well, these are the very pathways that are impacted in autism. So this period is a critical window. It's a critical window from two perspectives. It's a critical window if, that if there is an environmental hit here, it increases our risk. But it's also a critical window of opportunity that if we want to overcome the deficits in autism, treatment delivered here would be far more effective than treatment delivered later. But let's compare that underlying biology with the reality of how autism operates in the clinics. Currently in the US, according to CDC statistics, the median age of diagnosis is around four years. It has come down a little bit, but it's still hovering around four years. <coughs> Excuse me. So although much of the brain's activity that is relevant to autism spectrum disorder and the critical window of opportunity is happening in the first year of life, we are detecting autism far too late, almost four years later than we should. I use this very, and it's, it's an imperfect and very simplistic analogy when I convey this point to those who are not researchers in the autism field. I say that it's like putting on your helmet after you have fallen off your bicycle. Well, the critical window of opportunity when the helmet does its job is while you're riding the bike, not after you have fallen off it. And in many ways, that is what is happening here. We're detecting autism after the critical window of opportunity has passed. In the next few slides, I want to offer you some, some look into the science that we are doing here at our department, especially at the Lautenberg Lab. And I want to acknowledge um, Ellen Lautenberg and her family who have helped establish this lab and it is named after her late father, Senator Frank Lautenberg, who was a champion for children's um, environmental health. We are taking a three-pronged approach. We want to diagnose autism earlier we want to develop biomarkers for autism because we want to characterize the autism at a molecular level. Just like in precision medicine, now we characterize tumors and cancer using molecular tools and no two cancers are considered identical. The same way autism should not be, diagnosis and characterization should not be based on some population average. We need to understand what is happening at an individual level. So here's a look at the technology we use. And I must warn you, this slide is going to get busy. This is the most technical slide in, in my talk. So I'll build it up slowly. We use these unusual matrices. We are all familiar with having blood tests done, but here we are testing things like hair and teeth. And the reason we are testing them is because in very simplistic terms, they have growth rings in them. And using that idea of growth ring, just like in trees, we can measure many, many time points and therefore develop a dynamic profile of our physiology. That links back to what I said earlier, that the brain is dynamic. So when we use tools to measure our neurodevelopment, those must measure the dynamics of our brain. 
here's a graph. And for me, I'm very proud that to have created this graph along with, with uh, my colleagues, Christine Austin, um, and, and some of the slides or the images I'm gonna show later were developed by Dr. Doug Walker, where we have taken a single tooth or a single hair and gone back in time, even before birth, and develop this profile. Here we are showing one molecule that is linked to inflammation called C-reactive protein, but we can measure many, many things. And our aim is to continue to expand on those many, many things that I mentioned, looking at environment in a very holistic manner, things that we are exposed to, but also things that our body produces, our metabolism. In a very simple way, what we are doing is akin to what we often refer to as liquid biopsies in, in, in modern jargon or repeated blood tests. But from a single sample, we can get over 500 sequential time points. So that is the key technology that has allowed us to overcome some of the challenges that we have been struggling for so long with autism spectrum disorder. I want to acknowledge my, my one other colleague, Dr. Paul Curtin, who's helped us do these multinational studies. What I'm about to show you in very simplistic terms is a study that's taken us six, seven years to do. It's not a study in one country. We have taken a subset of a national Japanese study. Then we went to Sweden, did a study in twins to adjust for genetics. And we did a study at our own Mount Sinai Clinical Autism Center. The study includes over 500 participants. So it's not a small study by any means. And it, it is a study that focuses on accessibility of the patients to this technology. We are using a single strand of hair, just one strand of hair that you could put in an envelope and just mail to us. We have a very complicated lab assay that I won't go into. And then the data we generate is subjected to machine learning and artificial intelligence. And we end up with this product. It is a diagnostic aid. I want to be very clear about that. It's not a diagnostic test. It is an aid that will help the clinician along with many other tools, but currently it's over 90% accurate. And because we are focused on issues of equity and accessibility, the single strand of hair that a family member might send us requires no special processing. You don't have to come to the hospital to give a blood sample, which is especially challenging during a pandemic time. There is no freezing. You can pretty much use your standard mailing service to, to send it to us. We're also working very hard, and this is especially challenging because this is something that is uncommon for academics, that we are going to take this tool and rush it towards getting FDA approval and increase capacity through academic private partnerships so that we can help families, not just in the US, but around the globe. So this is a real success story at what an academics lab and academic science can do to help with a very complicated problem. I'm gonna just end very quickly in two more slides and talk about neurological diseases of later life. But you might wonder why are these tools that were developed for children and babies relevant to these diseases that impact us after we are 60, 70 years old? I always answer that with the simple question. You know, we all know where babies come from, but if you ask yourself, where do old people come from? The answer is they come from the same place as babies come from, because at the end of the day, all old people come from babies and the risk factors that we experienced as babies are what are leading to lifelong trajectories that might result in Lou Gehrig's disease or Parkinson's or Alzheimer's. So how is our brain health doing? How's our brain doing globally at the other end of life? Again, we are seeing these massive increases that we project as we become a, 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 a global population of older people. In many countries, we are aging rapidly, including in the US. So we expect to see increases in these diseases that occur in later life. We are getting older, we live longer, and we are accumulating all the risk factors. This is also true of Parkinson's disease. In this study, they looked at not just aging, but other aspects such as living longer, but smoking and the use of chemicals. And again, the projections are that we will continue to see a greater proportion of, of people in our population who are impacted by conditions like Parkinson's. And again, I want to close off by saying that the answers here cannot lie 
in just looking at genetics. If you look at this one study that was published by a colleague of ours who is now retired, who had looked at twins and said, well, what is the heritability of this condition? For Parkinson's, it's about 10%. And even for Alzheimer's, which is much higher, most of it is still environment. For ALS, it is less than, less than 10%. So the environment cannot be excluded from the studies of these older, older later life conditions, just like it cannot be excluded from the study of early life conditions, such as autism spectrum disorder. <clears throat> Over the last couple of years, I made it a practice to always end my talks on issues of social justice. And those issues also impact autism spectrum disorder. If you wish to look at a general uh, lay audience, easily accessible piece, you can go to the NPR website and they have a very nice story on how black and Latino children have trouble accessing diagnosis to autism, are diagnosed later in life, and therefore treatments are less effective for them. If you want a deeper, more technical dive, the CDC data itself says that children with autism, especially when they have more severe intellectual disabilities that are present in addition to their autism, receive the diagnosis much later than white children. And as we move forward, as we develop biomarkers and use advanced technology, for my team, it's important that we address the issues of equity and accessibility and allow this disparity to diminish as we understand the diseases better. With that, I'll, I'll end my talk <clears throat> and I'll just put up this slide, which acknowledges all the folks who are organizing this and who are working uh, for the Exposome Institute and for the department to, to make all this work possible. Uh, thank you again for this opportunity and, and I welcome any questions. Okay, um, thank you so much, Manish, for that amazing presentation. Um, I, I, I love listening to you and I, I think the, the accomplishments are, are incredible. Um, before we start the Q&A, um, I think there might be uh, another slide about the next conversation. I'm not certain, but um, I would like you to invite you all to join us uh, next Wednesday the 19th for a conversation with Dr. Robert Wright, co-director for the Institute of Exposomic Research. Dr. Wright will discuss how the science of exposomics is transforming environmental health and the promise it offers for medicine today. Um, can you advance to the next slide, please? So, how can you get more involved? First of all, uh, if you have concerns in your own community or even in your own home, our team of scientists and physicians are here to help. The team regularly responds to parents and others' questions and are also available to speak in your community. I have been involved in a volunteer capacity at Mount Sinai since 2010 and have witnessed firsthand the transformation of the environmental health research program here. Mount Sinai continues to attract some of the brightest scientists in this field, and our institute offers a multidisciplinary approach to research, education, and clinical care. What is truly exciting is that the innovative met methods being developed today are increasing the speed of scientific discovery, discovery and the possibility it offers for disease prevention. If you want to get more involved, we are seeking nominations for the Mount Sinai Exposomics and Children's Environmental Health Board, a new board that will philanthropically drive the work of the Institute. Please contact us to nominate someone or to learn more. And now uh, we will start the questions and uh, you can stop sharing the slide. Um, we have our first question, which is, um, while you mentioned that the first year is important for childhood development, later peaks beyond the first year are important too. Are you looking at later periods of child development as well? And what are you learning as it relates to continued environmental exposure and autism? That, that, that's a great question. <clears throat> and, and yes, so our study that is across three countries and we're constantly expanding it actually covers uh, the age ranges from one month 
to 67 years. Our oldest participant is 67 years in, in those studies. However, uh, it's the, the participation or the percentage of participants are not evenly distributed. We have actively focused on having a larger number in the younger age group, but we have quite a number of participants who are in their adolescent years and, and their young adulthood. So yes, what we're finding is that there are certain key biochemical indicators or pathways that are constantly disrupted and that allow us to detect autism using a biomarker, no longer just relying on questionnaire or observational tools, but using an actual biomarker at all of these ages. And, and they work quite well. So far, we are seeing that they work, they work equally well at all ages. The treatments will, of course, vary. So currently, we are focusing on treatment in the earliest uh, span of life, which is within the first year of life, because the biology supports the greatest gains there. However, you know, we're going to collaborate with our colleagues uh, who are then working with adult autism. One barrier there is that I do not believe personally, and this is my, more my sense than based on any large study, that one size will fit all when it comes to autism. First of all, it's a spectrum of disorders. So we'll have to do some deep molecular phenotyping, and there's a real need for precision medicine to treat different autism subdomains as their own condition, develop treatments that are specific to that, and, and then start examining them. So this is a long journey, but now we have tools that can allow us to effectively take that journey. Okay, great. Um, do you foresee using biomarkers to help distinguish different levels of severity in autism? Again, that, that's a very good, good question because yes, in autism, there's a wide range of severity which results in differences in quality of life. For example, if you have very mild autism, you can you know, hold down a job, do, do many things, but on the severe end, you require institutionalized care. And early results, this is early results, we are seeing that biomarkers correlate quite well with the severity as measured on, on um, existing tools, such as the ADOS you know, uh, tool, or which is a questionnaire-based tool that measures different um, um, uh, levels of autism or severity of autism. So we are seeing that, but that's early stage research. We, we still need to do more work there. Okay. What is most promising in terms of type of biomarkers um, such as in hair and, and teeth? Are well, you talking, sorry, th there's more to the question. Sure. Um, are you talking about metals, inflammation or something else? So we are, we are looking at, 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 we are going to take a multi-pronged approach. We are aiming to measure thousands of things. Our earliest efforts are looking at uh, three classes. Uh, some are essential elements that are key to our, our metabolism. Some are toxic elements. These are the bad actors that come in and try to disrupt this very well-evolved symphony of the human body. But they are also elements that have not been well studied. They, they're not acutely toxic but they're not essential either. What are they doing there? And they seem to be playing this role in autism. And that's where we'll have to you know, work with our, our colleagues in the basic sciences to figure out what's happening there. Then we're looking at inflammation. I presented some data on C-reactive protein. We're about to publish on that. We're also looking at metabolism. Uh, what are the different aspects of our metabolism, even prenatally, that increase our susceptibility to later diagnosis with autism? Interesting. Um, how should OBGYNs counsel their pregnant patient, patients to reduce risk? That, that's a very difficult question because currently uh, we don't have a, a way to know who is going to have a child with autism. Even if the prevalence rates are one to 2%, which is alarming. The flip side of that is 98% to 99% of children or newborns will not have autism. Having said that, there are some well-established risk factors. These shouldn't deter folks from having children. Uh, and I don't know the exact clinical utility of it, but older parents, especially the older father, is an established risk factor for, for, for a risk of having a child with, with, with autism. And, and that's the best I can answer this question because really that there is not enough data. Got it. Um, okay. Um, could hair or other tools work to diagnose, uh, this word is in quotes, pans or quotes, pandas, parentheses, severe form of obsessive compulsive disorders? So 
we, we have recently started a collaboration where we are looking at obsessive compulsive disorder. I don't have any data yet. However, we are studying things like ALS, schizophrenia, psychosis, irritable bowel disease, even some cancers. And what we find is that using hair and teeth has value to all of these. And the reason it has value is we can measure many, many things similar to what we can do with blood, measure thousands of things in teeth, for example. But we also have a temporal profile, which is missing from blood or urine tests because they're just snapshots. So we are, we are getting the, the, not only measuring the past of what happened to you when you were, before you were born or soon after you were born, we're also measuring the changes over time. And, and so I'm optimistic that this technology is not just something that will be useful for autism. It's an actual platform of innovation that will uh, help many, many conditions. I, I don't have data, but I know about PANS and PANDA, uh, but I don't have any data on that. We, like I mentioned, we are planning to start working on, on OCD as well, especially since there's a big overlap in those who have OCD and, and autism. Interesting. Um, okay, as, as a leader in environmental health, what are you most excited about now, both in terms of your own research, as well as in terms of translating that research to impact people's lives for better health outcomes? So what excites me the most is this just general increase in awareness in, in members of the community. So no longer is every conversation about genetics. We are now talking about the environment. We're talking about climate change. In fact, more importantly, we're talking about the climate crisis and the environmental crisis. People are actively looking for cleaner products and they're impacting the market. You know, before there was a time when you could only buy organic eggs and organic milk. Now, everything, there is a demand for it being organic. People are throwing away their plastic straws and saying, we want a better alternative. And that translates to the private sector responding to them. So this is becoming a, a virtuous cycle. We want better and the private sector is responding to that electric cars. It's just spreading everywhere. So that is so exciting to me. And I'm optimistic about the future that our children will actually inherit a better planet but, uh, than what we had. Uh, however, much more work has to be done. And that is where those members of the audience who are not scientists, you shouldn't feel that you don't have a part to play. In fact, your voice counts as much or even more sometimes when you say that I will make healthy choices and that will translate into these massive market forces and clean up our environment. So that's my response to what excites me about environmental health. It's not a very specific you know, biochemical answer to, oh, well, this drug might come and help. In fact, I want there to be less drugs that are used for these diseases that can be prevented. Okay, I think we've got one more question. Yeah. Um, since uh, Mount Sinai is home to both a medical school and a hospital network, how does that make research at Mount Sinai unique? And what does that mean for interventions and clinical care today? Well, it, it's a great place to, to research for that reason. We are a medical school, so we have all the, the advantages of being in an academic setting and the great exchange of information and ideas. But if I need samples, if I need you know, um, information on a disease or a clinical specialist. For example, in my own case, my lab is two floors above from the autism center. So I don't have to walk to a different campus or even a different building. I just have to take the elevator down two floors and I can talk to clinicians. I also have to say that having worked at many institutions, Mount Sinai is one of the most pro innovation institutions. Here innovation is very heavily supported. I wouldn't have been able to do this work at many other institutions because it is high risk work. It, not everything that I you know, succeeds. So uh, I'm grateful to the institutional commitment to innovation, absolutely. Okay. Uh, okay, and getting back to prevention. Um, what should a pregnant woman avoid beyond what we normally hear about, you know, sort of typically um, about in, in terms of toxins? So. Absolutely. I mean, I have to say I haven't experienced pregnancy myself, but uh, I, I, I am the father of triplets. So my wife was pregnant. It was a high risk pregnancy. And I did do a lot of reading and trying to understand what I can do beyond just my knowledge base as a scientist. One thing that is often overlooked is our social environment. Having a strong social support network, especially during a pandemic when we're all feeling isolated, 
I cannot understate the importance of that just from a personal experience. And clean living, you know, it, it is easy to say, but maybe not that, that easy to implement. If you can avoid toxic substances, utilize organic products as much as possible, reduce packaging, the least processed uh, what you're eating, the better off it is for you. So avoid packaging, because it might be organic what, what is inside the packet, but what is surrounding it can expose you to microplastics and so many other things. So just those core concepts of very clean living, I think are very, very important. Yeah. Of course, that makes a lot of sense. Um, okay, I think it looks like um, we've dealt with all our questions. Um, unless anyone has another one, um, that's the only ones that I see. So um, I think we will start to wrap up and um, thank you everyone who has joined us today. Um, we are going to put up a slide momentarily so that you can give your feedback through uh, a quick survey. So Carla, if there is a slide uh, for the survey, um, that way you can take a picture of the QR code to access the survey with your smartphone. You can access the survey with your smartphone um, and fill it out now, or when you get a follow-up email, it will also be in there. Um, your feedback really has an impact on our programming. So we greatly appreciate you um, filling out the survey if you don't mind. If there are questions that we didn't get to today, um, we can also include those in an email as a follow-up. So if you still have questions, please put them in the Q&A. And um, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, enjoy the rest of your day, and I hope that you join us for our subsequent lunchtime chats. Thank you. <laughs>